so the class is being recorded as usual. Again, this is Dr. Samah Abdel Jalil, and this is AA 100A. And today we're doing um, the rest of Dr. Faustus and Christopher Marlowe. Uh, of course, we start with Christopher Marlowe because he is the creator of Dr. Faustus, right? Had it not been for Dr. Uh, for Marlowe, we wouldn't have had uh, Dr. Faustus. Um, we spoke about the reasons why we're featuring Marlowe and not um, William Shakespeare, for for example. And we said that uh, the chapter, or, or, or actually the whole book has a theme and this theme uh, cuts across the different chapters and the theme is about reputation, good and bad. Uh, and it is also about uh, contested and uh, um, disputed reputations. Uh, the idea that uh, people are sometimes polarized on the personality and the reputation of some uh, figures, historical, uh, artistic or any otherwise. So uh, Christopher Marlowe happens to be one of those um, figures. Um, for all the beauty of what he is uh, or he was doing in terms of art and literature, he has um, those um, kind of, um, you know, um, issues and problems. And that would um, eventually uh, lead people to perhaps disapprove of him and uh, may may not even consider him uh, for um, a place in, in in literary history, for example. Remember when we spoke about Christopher Marlowe, we said that he came to uh, or end to his own uh, only in the 19th century. He got recognized and he became a canonized writer in the 19th century when the Romantics uh, came over and they uh, they had among themselves people who were as radical, people who were um, as weird. Uh, when we talk about Shelley, for example, when we talk about Lord Byron, those were uh, 19th century Romantic poets who uh, had also, uh, um, you know, um, um, repute and ha they had the reputations, uh, you know, uh, spoken ill about because of their, um, you know, radicalism um, when it comes to politics in the case of Shelley and also, uh, um, you know, weird behavior when it comes to uh, Lord Byron. So it was only in the 19th century that Marlowe um, got recognized as a great talent. So it's, it's um, I mean, the whole chapter and actually the whole book is about uh, just that. It's about uh, people whose reputations are, you know, um, you know, are disputed and are, um, you know, spoken about um, not in a very straightforward way. Um, okay, so let's go to the uh, to the chapter that we have, and let's continue uh, with Marlowe and Dr. Faustus. Um, again, uh, another question would have to do with why, of all uh, the other uh, works, we're having Dr. Faustus. Um, as you are aware, uh, Marlowe wrote a number of uh, books and a number of plays and they were all um, as great. Why would uh, the book feature Dr. Faustus? And the simple answer uh, has to do with the fact that there is a great deal of parallels, there is a great deal of correspondence and similarities between uh, Dr. Faustus and Marlowe. Um, the idea of uh, radicalism, the idea of uh, ambition and the idea of um, you know going beyond the limits and asking for more uh, greed for knowledge and greed for power uh, greed for everything 
um, you know, that um, that is otherwise uh, not given uh, due to human limitations. Uh, this is what uh, we are um, stressing all the time. I mean, these are the, the, the main ideas that, that the book and the chapter is all about. Let me share with you the slides or the book rather and see how we're going to handle that. Um, just give me a second. So can you see that? Yes, it's clear. OK. So Christopher Marlowe, everyone, and Dr. Faustus. OK. Uh, I'm not going to go over what we have done, obviously, and that would be very boring. And I'm just going to just refresh your memories about what the things that we have covered uh, and the things that we're likely to cover tonight. So again, Christopher Marlowe, we started with an introduction and it was um, the introduction was about the. Uh, the goals that we set for ourselves reading and studying uh, this chapter, we spoke about close reading, the fact that you also uh, need to um, be able to to read um, a, a, you know, a part of a play, for example, very closely and by reading um, a text very closely, it means that you try to kind of unpack the concepts that the, the passage uh, projects and gives, and you try to relate it to whatever comes before and whatever comes after. You try to set it in time and in context. And this is um, what we did at one point when we spoke about some of the lines and the quotes that we have taken from Dr. Faustus. Well, we were likely to continue Oh, um, and sustain this effort uh, tonight, inshallah. So what else um, uh, is um, um, yeah, among our aims? Um, another um, goal or aim would be uh, the idea of reading something against the um, its um, historical background. You read uh, a piece of work um, against its uh, its age and time and what uh, used to happen at the time. Um, this is what we call historical reading. This is what we call um, also uh, 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 thematic uh, and biographical reading. Biographical in the sense that you set the, the play against um, the, I mean, the history and the historical uh, uh, context uh, of the time. There is obviously nothing wrong with that, but it shouldn't be, um, you know, um, our dominant approach. There are other approaches, and one of them would be the formal approach, where you focus on the form or the structure of the piece of work. What makes the piece of work a piece of work? What makes a drama different, uh, for example, from a novel or a short story? We focus on the literariness of the work uh, of art, and literariness does not come uh, out when we uh, talk about history, when we talk about the, the work as uh, a historical document. It only comes when we check what makes this piece of work um, uh, a piece of work from the aesthetic point of view, from the, uh, the tools that the writer uses in order to deliver whatever messages uh, he has, he or she, of course. Um, OK, um, so we spoke about Christopher Marlowe and his um, biography, the fact that he wasn't um, 
you know, an easy guy when it comes to dealing with him. Um, regard, I mean, in, in spite of the fact that he was uh, an artist or a writer, uh, and those people are normally very sensitive. They, um, I mean, they keep to themselves. They don't um, kindly, uh, any kind of mix with, with, with people a lot. They have their own, um, you know, way and style of life, which is normally, you know, uh, perhaps quiet and relaxed. But uh, Christopher Marlowe happens to be different. Um, uh, he wouldn't settle for easy answers and for, um, you know, um, a relaxed or um, a quiet kind of life. He would um, challenge everything. He would challenge uh, orthodoxies, existing orthodoxies, whether those were um, religious or uh, political. Um, uh, we spoke about some of the um, testimonials about him during his time. And uh, for the most part, the testimonials were negative. People were uh, referring to him as a uh, as um, a transgressor and an outreacher, somebody who, again, would challenge uh, the sensitivities and the sensibility, the, uh, the sensibilities of, pe of the people of the time by uh, perhaps um, saying bad stuff about their um, um, their religion and their religious beliefs and their and their uh, traditions and all these kinds of things. Um, um, again, this is uh, what people, uh, this was the dominant image about him in um, the late 16th and the early 17th century. And this, ha this is going to dog him until we come to the 19th century, where, um, you know, uh, people are going to reconsider uh, what, ha I mean, had been said about him and and they are going to perhaps give him some credit for uh, purely uh, on artistic uh, grounds and terms. And they would say uh, it is true that he, he has or he was radical. He had um, radical uh, views, but this is not perhaps our main concern. Our main concern would be talent, whether he is talented or, or not, and of course he was supremely talented. So that's why he, uh, in the 19th century, during the uh, the age of the Romantics and beyond, uh, people to, uh, started to uh, give him um, what he deserves in terms of literary prestige, in terms of even canonizing him. We spoke about the canon and we said that the canon is a, a list of approved writers and approved works of art. So finally enough, in the 19th century, Christopher Marlowe would be approved and he would be canonized and, and, and he would become a part of the canon, like Shakespeare and like all the other approved and canonized uh, writers. Um, when we go down and we go to Dr. Faustus, the play, we see um, a lot of similarities, like I said, between the two. Uh, we need to always remember that Christopher Marlowe and Dr. Faustus's creation were byproducts of the uh, early modern age, the Renaissance and Renaissance, like uh, we always say, is um, is where there and when there is a shift of interest from God to man, from religion in the Middle Ages to science, to the sciences and arts uh, um, in the early modern age. We're talking about the 16th and 17th and even the 18th century and beyond. Um, so the play has to be read against uh, this background, uh, the flourishing and the development and the advancement of uh, the sciences and the arts. Um, during the reign of uh, Elizabeth uh, I, uh, we, we normally call in this period the Elizabethan age. 
Um, um, what else about this period? We, we'll talk about the play and see how much it is um, a renaissance uh, byproduct and how much it is also uh, um, um, kind of uh, related to the Middle Ages. Because uh, if you still remember, we said that there is an element uh, of the Middle Ages uh, to it. And the fact that we have um, some of the elements uh, of the morality play and the morality play, like we said, is a medieval or a middle ages, uh, um, you know, product and feature. Um, OK, and then we went all the way to the play itself and we started to talk about we um, I think we're done with um, Act one spoke about act one and the first soliloquy and what when so, uh, first of all we spoke about the prologue and what happens in the pro prologue and we said that the, pro the prologue serves as an introduction where you normally introduce to the different uh, um, ideas that the play is about and also you have uh, the, the characters or the main characters presented the prologue is normally uh, given by the chorus and this is what we're having here also the chorus introduces the product and when we spoke about the chorus we said that the chorus is um, is a Greek invention it belongs to uh, Greek literature and uh, it was uh, perhaps revived uh, in the Elizabethan age um, unlike uh, Greek uh, tragedies and Greek plays where you normally have more than one um, character as a chorus in the Elizabethan age and in Dr. Faustus you only have one uh, character playing the chorus and this is one of the basic differences. We um, spoke about the chorus in Dr. Faustus and what the, um, the chorus uh, said. Um, the chorus started off by referring to uh, the themes that the play is not about. Um, so that's not about love. It's not. Uh, it's not about war. And then uh, he will. I mean, the the, the 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 character who plays the chorus will introduce uh, the character of Doctor Faustus and would refer to the fact that he was, you know exceptional and everything but but he has uh, a problem and the problem has to do with the fact that he has what we call vaulting ambition he does not stop at anything to achieve his ambition and his ambition is big um, the fact that he wants to master um, uh, he already mastered the, the, the sciences uh, uh, and the knowledge that was available at the time, but obviously he's not happy with that. He's not satisfied. Uh, he wants absolute power. He wants absolute um, delight. He wants uh, absolute knowledge. Um, again, the idea of absolute uh, is a problem because um, as a human being, you have limits and you have to respect and honor uh, um, do those limits. You have to remember that you're not another God on earth. You're limited. You're a human being with limitations. So you have to keep to these limitations. Um, again, um, um, Dr. Faustus um, and um, Marlu live in an age that obviously um, um, that is obviously promoting the idea that man uh, has potential and man should unleash his potential and nothing should stop or stops man from uh, achieving the impossible. Uh, as a matter of fact, he was a byproduct of the age. So to blame him for that would be uh, uh, to also claim the entire age, the early modern age with, with, with its focus on, hu on human beings, on, on 
um, the limitless abilities and the exceptional abilities of human beings. So more or less, Dr. Faustus, uh, more or less Marlowe uh, uh, were uh, products of their age that would promote um, the fact that human beings um, um, should should be given the opportunity to to go even beyond that limits. They don't actually um, admit or acknowledge the fact that the human being has limits. Um, OK, let's go to the part that we have stopped at and see how we're going to handle it. Do you have any questions so far? No, thanks. No, doctor. Okay. No, thank you. Remember that we we also said that even the style of writing that uh, Marlow adopted was also a reflection of his character and his personality. Remember when we said that he used or he used. Um, you know, free verse or blank verse. And uh, free or blank verse is this kind of verse where you don't normally stick to traditional rules when it comes to the rhyme and the rhythm of uh, uh, of the poem or, 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 or the play in general. And this is again uh, a reflection of the character of Marlowe who does not believe in rigid rules and regulations. He would challenge even the uh, artistic and the, the literary traditions of the time. So it's it's not only a religion that he was challenging. It was it wasn't only tradition and social norms that he was challenging. He was also challenging, um, you know, art, artistic and um, literary traditions. And one big uh, um, um, you know, uh, one big uh, experimentation he was trying his hand with would be the idea of blank verse. Blank verse is free verse, and this is very um, consistent with his character as a free spirit, uh, as somebody who does not believe in limitations and in rigid uh, formulas. Um, OK, so we spoke about the play as a morality play, and we said that the morality play is um, a remnant of the um, Middle Ages, uh, where the focus would be on, on giving moral lessons through simple, simple plays, and those simple, simple plays would, you know, give you abstractions of, you know, ideas. So you normally have ideas, and those ideas are uh, embodied in uh, in the shape of human beings. Um, again, why would we have uh, plays like these? Because people were, for the most part, uneducated. And um, during the Middle Ages, the church was in full control, and they wanted to give people uh, message. They wanted to teach people, um, you know, uh, religion and, and other uh, things. So how can you teach people if you don't have books? You normally have the theater where uh, people would uh, wear, you know, uh, uh, pieces of clothes that would indicate that they represent certain values. You have the value of good as represented by an actor, you have the value of evil. Um, again, given human embodiment, you have values like, um, you know, um, and abstractions like the idea of greed, the idea of jealous and jealousy, the idea of treachery. OK, the seven deadly sins, if you're familiar with them. Gluttony, gluttony means eating too much. So they would give a human uh, embodiments to these uh, values and, the, and these ideas. Um, and they have them fight each other. And normally 
good values win over bad ones. And the message would be clear uh, to people that they should be behaving in, uh, in an appropriate way. I mean, they should follow whatever is good, whatever is uh, positive, whatever is religious, and they try to steer away from whatever is bad and whatever is negative. So again, uh, Dr. Faustus, when you look at the play, you find that the play has a measure of the morality play in it. Um, how could I know that? It's through some of the, um, the characters, for example, the fact that you have um, the traditional uh, morality play characters of uh, the good and the evil angels, the, the character of the old man. So obviously in life you don't have angels, right? We, um, we believe in them, right? But we don't see them. So this is an element of the supernatural. And this was uh, there in the play. You have good and evil angels. Um, again, this is the contribution of the morality play to uh, Dr. Faustus. Uh, why are we having them? Uh, this is actually one of the questions that we keep asking. Why would I have elements of the morality, the supernatural, one of the supernatural elements of the morality play in an early modern play like Dr. Faustus? Um, again, uh, if I have them, it means that um, I, I might have to um, uh, not to come up with easy, um, you know, assessment or assessments of of uh, of Dr. Faustus and uh, and uh, Marlow and, and say, for example, that Marlow was uh, radical, that Marlow was a promoter of um, atheism uh, and that he doesn't believe in God. Perhaps he is uh, presenting those elements of the morality in order to tell people um, that um, there will be a limit uh, for everything. It is true that you can be talented, you can be exceptionally smart, but you have to know your limits. Uh, you have to always remember that you are a human being with limitations. You have to always remember that um, that um, um, you know that the devil is um, always um, you know insinuating um, um, and is um, trying to kind of um, dissuade you uh, from. Uh, following the, the, the right or the righteous path. Um, again, uh, having the morality play with its focus on, um, you know, morality, on, on, on urging the individual uh, and the members of the audience to follow the right path, we start to reassess um, 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 Marlow every now and then and see whether uh, uh, we can come up with, um, you know, um, a fair judgment of his character, whether he was a radical or uh, um, uh, an orthodox, um, uh, yeah, an orthodox writer, an orthodox writer, somebody who uh, would uh, defend religion, somebody who would defend traditions. So it's the element of morality play that uh, keeps us uh, always on our toes. We don't know uh, whether to, to say that Marlow is um, radical or uh, an orthodox writer. Um, again, we move further down. We are in the play proper, and the play proper starts, like I said, with the chorus, and we said that the chorus is a Greek um, contribution. Um, the chorus um, is meant to introduce 
us to the characters and from time to time to give us uh, the moral uh, lesson, if any. Um, so what is it that the chorus in, is doing in Dr. Faustus? Again, it introduced the prologue and it, it spoke uh, uh, or he, I mean, the member of the chorus uh, spoke to us about um, the play and what we are in for and the character of Dr. Faustus. So the chorus spends several lines telling the audience what the play is not about. It's not about war or love or martial heroism. And then he uh, in, engages in talk about the character of Dr. Faustus. And through the chorus, we get to know that Dr. Faustus comes from a low, um, you know, a low family, low in the sense that they were not financially uh, good. I mean, parents base of stock. He was poor, and um, and in spite of the fact that he was poor, he could make it big in the world of science. Um, and he uh, had um, uh, a PhD or a doctorate degree at a very early age. Uh, again, the chorus right from the very beginning would warn us against, um, you know, what um, Marlowe refers to as cunning of a self-conceit. The fact that you can, it, it, there is obviously nothing wrong with mastering, um, you know, knowledge of um, wanting to know more and more and more, but you shouldn't be uh, um, that, that, that you have to set limits to yourself, intellectual limits. You shouldn't be going as far as, um, you know, nursing or having intellectual uh, pride, uh, which is engendered by arrogance. Um, when you reach this stage, uh, obviously, you are uh, in trouble because your self uh, conceit would lead you to ignore the um, the limits that are set to you. And if you ignore the limits, the likelihood that you uh, transgress again, God is high. And if you transgress and go beyond uh, your limits, you, you uh, will not get away with it. You will be uh, punished for it. Um, again, so with uh, Faustus, uh, his intellectual pride would lead him to take up the study of magic. And of course, uh, you know that magic is not sanctioned or allowed uh, in um, religion. Um, conjuring up magic is a no-no in religion, and if you do that, it means that you are defying the will of God. And defying, of course, the will of God is, um, is not um, something that uh, can be taken lightly. You, if you do that, and if you insist on that, you will be... Um, granted eternal uh, or you will earn eternal um, you know damnation and you end up um, being thrown into hell fire okay remember I spoke about uh, the comparison that the comparison sorry remember the comparison that the chorus was making between 
Dr. Faustus in his ambition and in, in his transgression with Icarus, the mythical uh, Greek figure Icarus. And Icarus, if you still remember, um, was a Greek mythical figure that uh, could at one point create wings, and those wings were made uh, um, uh, from wax. And he could uh, use them, he could travel or fly with them for a while before um, they came close to the sun. And the next thing you know is that they melted. And of course, when they melt, uh, he, uh, he would fall uh, and die. Okay, so Dr. Faustus is more or less an um, Icarus or Icaron figure who would not stop at anything. So instead of the waxes uh, that Icarus used, we have Dr. Faustus um, using magic and using uh, or conjuring up magic. Again, um, trying to reach, I mean, obviously Icarus was not a bird, otherwise there, there wouldn't be uh, uh, nothing wrong with him trying to fly. But he is not a bird, and that's why uh, his act was seen as a transgression against the gods. Uh, and in uh, the same way, um, Dr. Faustus was also seen as a transgressor. If, if God and if religion uh, are telling you that magic um, and conjuring up magic um, is bad and is against religion and you insist on, on, on practicing it, it means that you are defying God, uh, defying the will of God. Okay, so you will be given the opportunity to practice magic, but at one point you, you will be damned and you will be thrown into hell. So it's almost the same uh, kind of thing. Only the tool is different. With Icarus, you have uh, the waxed wings, and with Dr. Faustus, you have magic. So as, as I said, um, Dr. Faustus is, is looked upon as an Icarus uh, like figure, Icarus like um, figure, um, as uh, an Icarus like overreaching um, person, and that would bring him into conflict with the Christian God force. <clears throat> And then we move on to um, after the prologue, uh, we have Dr. Faustus and we have his first speech. His first speech was given when he was all alone. So when you have a character who is giving a speech on the stage and nobody is around him uh, or her, uh, this is called a soliloquy. So we're uh, met with Faustus' first soliloquy. And uh, why do we have soliloquies? Soliloquies uh, gives us insights um, into um, whatever the, the, the character is thinking of. Otherwise, we wouldn't know what his um, plans are, what, uh, what he has in mind. So in order to have uh, some kind of peak, some kind of entry into the mind and the soul of that character, you sometimes have soliloquies. Uh, if we count the number of soliloquies that we have um, for Dr. Faustus, we have uh, three and every and each one of them uh, marks a stage in the career and uh, the life of Dr. 
uh, Faustus. These are turning points um, that would um, contribute together to uh, the, the, the end that we have of Dr. Faust, and the fact that you would die tragically at the end. So Dr. Faustus delivers his first speech. Um, again, uh, we'll have in the background, he is in his study, and in the background, we will have books by uh, great writers. Um, we would have um, books for the Greek philosopher Aristotle. Uh, you would have books for the Greek medical authority Galen. Um, you would have books for the Roman emperor and jurist Justinian. OK, when you look at these books, uh, and the people who uh, wrote them, you would have the idea that he 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 left no uh, science or uh, field of knowledge un, uh, unturned. He tried everything. Again, that would give you um, the idea um, it, um, that um, uh, he has this. Um, um, you know, appetite for more, the fact that he's not happy. I mean, he mastered all of them, but he is asking for more. Again, that, that would give you uh, clues about what kind of characters, a character we are in for. Again, that would also give you the impression that this guy is very knowledgeable, that this guy um, you know, has deep learning. Again, he starts to talk, and if he talks on the stage alone, you know that you are in for a soliloquy that is meant to establish a strong relationship between him and the audience. And it also gives us access to um, his mind and what he is thinking of and what his plans are. Again, uh, this is how he started. He uh, talks uh, or addresses himself in the third person. Um, and um, he is also using, I mean, as if he's talking to somebody. Settle thy studies, Faustus, and begin. Begin what? Okay, when you proceed, you know that he, uh, he would begin thinking of more. Um, I mean, hoping for more, more knowledge, more power, uh, more everything. Uh, again, um, this is meant to be performed on the stage, and the character who plays Faustus uh, uh, would give you the impre impression that he is not satisfied and he's restless uh, through, of course, his voice. Again, he is impatient for more knowledge, and this should be given uh, and communicated through his voice. Again, he mastered all the academic disciplines of the time, philosophy, medicine, law, and theology, and he dismisses all of them, and he believes that they don't lead to anything. He still cannot raise the dead. Um, he still uh, cannot be, um, there are limits to the knowledge, and he cannot uh, achieve everything. Uh, when contemplating his own remarkable achievements in medicine, for example, he laments uh, um, the fact that he can he can cure illness. Uh, he is unable either to give his uh, his patients eternal right, life or raise them from the dead. Again, I can cure them, but cure them up to a limit. I cannot 
give them uh, eternity and I cannot raise them from the dead. Uh, again, uh, who can raise people from the dead? Who can give people eternity? It's God. So it is as if he is trying to, uh, uh, to assume the role of God on earth, which is obviously, uh, um, uh, which cannot happen because he is only a human being. That's why he keeps telling himself, yet art thou still but Faustus and a man. You're still Faustus, you're not God, and you are a man, a man with limitations and limits. So he cannot be a mighty God or a deity. Uh, and he believes at one point that um, if he practices magic, uh, he will be able to realize those goals, to be another God on earth. Again, you have to also uh, um, give uh, Faustus some, uh, perhaps, um, some justification in what he does. He was the product of his time, and his time in the Renaissance uh, focused on the idea of man, that man can do uh, any and everything. So he is partly to blame, uh, and his uh, his age is also partly to blame. Um, um, as he, he was a 16th century humanist, um, and obviously, uh, like I said, he was uh, a byproduct of his age, um, and you may want to, uh, you know, kind of uh, think of him as a victim, perhaps, of uh, the, the age that he was born in, but you also need to remember that he was carrying it to extremes. He, uh, what he did was uh, extreme. Again, you might, uh, or you may want to think of the play as uh, a warning by Marlu. Um, uh, Marlowe is obviously trying to warn us not to overstate the secular values of um, Renaissance England. Uh, this again, this is the conflict that we're having. This this um, this is one of the struggles that we're having with Marlowe. Marlowe, uh, what is it exactly that Marlowe is trying to say? Is he for the image of the transgressor, the overreacher, and the uh, the rule breaker, or is he for um, God abiding individuals who uh, would not try to overstep their position in the universe? Again, um, th there would be uh, a room for the good and the evil angels to walk into the stage and uh, uh, talk to uh, Dr. Faustus. And of course, like we said, the good and the evil angels are uh, fighting over the soul and the mind of Dr. Faustus. The good angel would uh, tell him not to practice magic because magic is bad and evil. The evil angel would uh, tell him that magic would allow him the opportunity to have all the power there is and to have all uh, the knowledge there is and to have all uh, the pleasure there is.
spoke about the comic scenes, if you still remember, and we said uh, um, uh, in the midst of this kind of uh, gloomy atmosphere, where uh, Dr. Faustus is toying with very big decisions that would cost him his own life and even beyond, you would need some refreshment, some uh, relaxation from the tension uh, uh, and the roll, roller, uh, perhaps uh, coasting atmosphere that Dr. Faustus had us in. So you need to have some comic refreshment. Um, comic refreshment is normally given by minor characters, and we have two minor characters, and they would uh, walk into uh, uh, the stage and they start to kind of uh, play uh, pranks and tricks on each other. Um, and even uh, um, um, when we have this comic relief, we still have some seriousness to them because uh, um, uh, there is going to be some kind of comparison and cor correspondence between what Dr. Faustus uh, did, uh, which is the idea of striking a pact or an agreement with the devil, and uh, what the two characters are uh, perhaps fighting over. They're fighting over um, uh, um, um, a piece of mutton, and there is always this comparison between this piece of mutton and what Dr. Faustus did uh, um, to the extent that uh, um, um, you wouldn't get the impression that uh, what um, Dr. Faustus did was m no more than a piece, uh, a piece of mutton, which is obviously a reference to the fact that what he did he did what he did, I mean, selling his soul to the devil for nothing, for uh, as if it was for a mere uh, piece of mutton. Am I clear enough? Do you have any questions? No, 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 doctor. No, thank you. No, no. sorry. Okay, good. Nothing yet. Okay. Uh, of course, you know what what happens, right? The uh, idea that um, what he he has been doing was um, making up his mind to sell his soul to the devil in exchange for 24 years in which he will live in all voluptuousness. Voluptuousness means pleasure, absolute and extreme uh, pleasure. Um, when we move to Act 2, we're going to uh, have another soliloquy also by Dr. Faustus. Um, so the first one, um, we have him being um, referred to as self-conceited, as proud and arrogant. He was obviously taking pride in um, the amounts of knowledge that he has. Okay, and towards the the end of the act, uh, it seemed that he, he he made up his mind. Again, when we start act two and we start with another soliloquy, we would see a change in his behavior, a change of heart, perhaps, where you can almost tell that he is not fully. Uh, convinced with the, the moves that he is making and he is still having self-doubt and he is, um, there is this inner division within his soul and mind. He's not totally, um, you know, satisfied with the move that he is going to make, the idea of selling his soul to the devil. He, his voice sounds uh, less confident, uh, and he keeps asking uh, himself uh, questions. So whenever people ask 
questions uh, if they are taking a big decision and there are still questions that they are asking it means that they are not 100 percent uh, you know sure of the, the the movements that they are making and the decisions that they are taking um, he asks for him for, for example he asks himself what puts it then to think of god or heaven what is the use if if I have? He, I mean, he, it is as if he is telling himself that um, 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 I, perhaps I I have angered God um, enough, and the idea of waiting for uh, divine intervention and godly intervention uh, is uh, out of the question. And then he starts to, uh, um, after he, he thinks of God and the prospect of God uh, forgiving him and, and stuff, he would dismiss that saying that these are fancies. And he would say, um, 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 there is, um, I, don't, I don't believe that God can help me. And I should be trusting more in the devil. And he would, uh, uh, ask himself to be resolute. Resolute means that you made up. I made up my mind, and I'm going to sell my soul. Why backtracking? Why am I uh, going back to those uh, old thoughts of God and forgiveness and everything? So, um, as you can see, uh, Faustus is ordering himself not to backtrack, and then. Uh, he would reinforce this idea of, you know, showing resoluteness, showing, um, you know, confidence by saying, why wavers now? Why are you wavering now? You have made up your decision. You have made up your mind, so you need to stick. To okay, and then another voice would come urging him to repent. Uh, you know, reminding him of the fact that God is always there and God is ready to to help those who repent. This voice would tell him, abjure this magic and turn to God again. Again, and he would think about it for a while um, and, and then uh, changes his mind one more time. As you can see, he is in a state of struggle. I mean, he's struggling with himself. He's wrestling with his conscience in this soliloquy. He wants to, to, to repent. Uh, um, again, um, this would be followed by thoughts of, um, you know, the devil and what the devil is telling him about the life of pleasure and the life of knowledge and power awaiting him. Um, again, the fact that Lucifer or the devil wins would give you uh, uh, the idea that perhaps um, Faustus and behind him, Marlu, um, um, do not believe that that God can uh, really, uh, you know, um, you know, forgive them. Um, and the fact that the word despair is uh, more pronounced than the word repentance, for example. There is this emphasis on the idea of uh, despair rather than repentance and godly forgiveness. Um, why? Why do we have that? Uh, do we have an interpretation for that? Yes, we, we do have an interpretation for that. Um, at, we're talking about um, the Elizabethan age, we're talking about a time when um, England was moving from Catholicism to Protestantism. Protestantism uh, um, with its um, radical belief, and not all Protestants are like this. There is this uh, brand or, or type of Protestantism that is called Cal Calvinist uh, Protestantism that would say that no matter how hard you try, 
no matter how hard you uh, try to earn the mercy uh, and the love of God in order to eventually go to the heavens and go to paradise, no matter how hard you try, you're not allowed this advantage. This is a privilege that only God uh, gives you. God um, chooses. You, um, you, you try as much as you can, but if you're not chosen by God, uh, um, you you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't be allowed uh, access into the heavens into paradise. So it's not through your works. It's not through your 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 good deeds. You do uh, good deeds in the hope that you are one of those uh, chosen by God. Okay. So as you can see, the play and the despair that. Uh, Dr. Faustus is showing uh, is perhaps um, an, an influence uh, um, um, of, of this idea that um, you don't go to heavens through your works, uh, through your good deeds. So uh, perhaps and perhaps Faustus is, is, is trying to uh, to say that no matter how hard I try, I'm, I cannot guarantee heaven. I cannot guarantee, uh, um, you know, forgiveness from God. Uh, perhaps I, I'm not one of those uh, chosen few that God would allow into heaven. So this is an extreme kind of Protestantism that was there, but it, it, it underwent a number of changes and it's no longer um, you know, embraced by so many people. And this is called Calvinism, where the focus is uh, again on the idea of the original sin. No, no matter how hard you try, you are sinful. And unless God chooses you to uh, go to heaven and to go to paradise, you, you won't. It's not through your deeds, good as they are. So again, uh, Calvinism argued that salvation is entirely God's gift rather than the result of any human effort. <clears throat> so God gives that gift only to a fortunate few whom he had chosen. Everyone else faces an eternity of hell fire. Uh, perhaps uh, Faustus attitude is a reflection of just uh, that he does not uh, believe that uh, I mean he, he cannot guarantee uh, that by uh, perhaps um, repenting that he would be accepted into heaven. Again, uh, people would say, OK, so if it's not about Calvin and his extreme ideology, so uh, it can be um, that Faustus is also, uh, or, or, or perhaps Marlowe is showing a Christian God, the Christian God as being perhaps indifferent. Uh, Lucifer is from time to time struggling with, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Faust is struggling with Lucifer and the other devils. And uh, it seems that God, according to um, what is being uh, watched and what is being seen, does not interfere uh, to help and save Faustus. And this is also something that would anger the members of the audience who are Christian, who believe in uh, a merciful, benevolent God. So again, people would ask, why didn't God interfere? From time to time, we're, we're, um, we see that Dr. Faustus is not resolute. He is wavering. If he is wavering, it means that he's not 100% sure 
sure of what he is doing. And there is this uh, perhaps room for repentance. He wants to repent, but he wants to uh, somebody to encourage him. They are saying, why didn't God, the Christian God, step? Why didn't he step in and, uh, um, you know, uh, why didn't he took the hand of Dr. Faustus and uh, gave him the repent, uh, I mean, the forgiveness that he needed? Um, again, uh, the answer to this idea would be that um, they say, I mean, Faustus was wavering all the time. He didn't uh, make up his mind on either uh, side, and he he wasn't truly sincere about this kind of repentance. He was not. He was not really sincere. His repentance wasn't that in uh, that sincere for for God to in, intervene. So critics have argued that God is silent on 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 this occasion because Faustus' repentance is insincere and that he, he constantly fails to repent, not because he is suffering from theologically induced despair, but because he is afraid of the devils and constantly distracted by, the, uh, by frivolous entertainments. So again, God would have interfered if God had known, and of course God has absolute knowledge, uh, that um, um, the wish for repentance upon the part of Dr. Faustus was sincere and was serious. Okay. So can you still can you still see the book? Yes. Okay. Good. Yes. Yes, doctor. You don't have any questions so far. No questions at all. No questions. Okay. Um. Again. Uh, uh, um, in, in, in defense of the ways of God to man, and man here, of course, happens to be Dr. Faustus, um, some critics would refer to the idea that God does not want to interfere because this idea of uh, free choice and free will, the fact that um, human beings are given the freedom to either uh, embrace religion and obey God or disobey. So um, freedom of choice, uh, free will is part and parcel of religion. So if God interferes uh, to direct Dr. Faustus in a, in, in a certain way, it means that there is no free will, there is no freedom of choice. So this would be another reason uh, why God does not interfere. And they would um, illustrate that by referring to the good and the evil angels. And they would say that the good and the evil angels would represent the two uh, tracks or the two roads that people uh, um, have to choose uh, from. Remember? The road not taken by Robert Frost, if you have done EL121N, where you, you have two roads. One of them is um, the perhaps the road um, used by, by good people, and you also have the evil road that is uh, trodden by the evil ones. So, and it's up to you. You choose to go this or that way. But this is freedom of choice, and uh, this is free will, and if God interferes in this case, it means that there is no uh, freedom of choice. Doctor, can I say something? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, like, 
God did like interfere at some point when he kept sending him signs to repent, like the good angel, the old man, the the craving on his hand when he made the deed. Isn't that uh, all signs from God? Somehow? Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. I mean, uh, um, obviously, uh, this was um, kind of defense. This is what some critics are saying. I mean, when when people said that God, uh, in the case of Dr. Faustus, um, was not uh, perhaps um, reacting or responding or was indifferent in spite of the fact that um, Dr. Faustus was appealing to him, they would say that, um, you know, this idea of perhaps reacting would go against the idea of uh, freedom of choice. And they would also say, that God would have interfered had God known that he was, um, that Dr. Faustus was. So again, yeah, there were signs. Um, again, there were, uh, um, you know, places and areas in the play where God, um, God's presence is heavily felt. But there were areas where, again, uh, if, uh, um, if misconstrued, uh, people would say then that God is indifferent. God does not help him. So people came out in order to say no. Uh, intervention or total intervention is against the idea of freedom of choice and free will. Total intervention uh, would mean that God does not know because obviously Dr. Faustus was wavering. And Dr. Faustus uh, was not sincere. And of, co of course, God knows that he was not sincere. Uh, again, as you can see, uh, we have uh, the, the, the deal has been clenched. And Obviously, Dr. Faust starts his this 24-year uh, um, journey of absolute everything. But when you look at what he achieves, you're going to see that he achieved very little, if any. Um, sometimes he asks Lucifer, he's um, the devil, about things, and uh, Lucifer would kind of ignore his demands. Uh, he at, and at one point, he would ask for a wife and, and the guy wouldn't give him what he wants. Sometimes he asks about who created the world and and and, 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 uh, and how how it was created and he would he wouldn't be given an answer. Um, so again, if if you're asking questions and if you're having demands and they're not met, it means that you have achieved very little. Um, so what is it? that he achieved. When you look at the achievements, uh, you wouldn't call them achievements. Uh, he would, you would uh, think of Faustus as a court magician. He would go and entertain emperors with um, those, um, you know, light uh, tricks. Uh, tricks that any magician, any, uh, any guy would, would, uh, would, use and would uh, master. So again, whatever uh, uh, he was um, planning to do came down to mere uh, pranks and, and tricks, uh, magical tricks that any, uh, any magician, any ordinary magician can, can, can do. So, um, um, among those, uh, um, you know, scenes that would show you that his achievements came to nothing would be at one point he would uh, play the role of court magician, entertaining the Emperor Charles V and then the Duke and Duchess of Vanant. Uh, he would conjure uh, tricks. So uh, if you can see, these scenes highlight the hollowness of Faustus' achievements. It's nothing that he has achieved. So no big and grand dreams of immense power. 
all he manages to become is the entertainer of the established ruling elite. He, he was given to us and he was trying to impress on us as a big uh, transgressor, somebody who is, uh, he, who is trying to go beyond his limits, only to find him entertaining uh, um, the established ruling elite. So he is not the ripple that he was trying to, to, uh, to tell us that he was. Again, none of the big and grand dreams uh, was achieved. He, he is still unable to raise people from the dead. Um, all he can do is no more than, you know, uh, summon spirits who resemble uh, people like Alexander and stuff. But he doesn't have real power. Um, and uh, even he himself, at one point, the Duchess of Van, he was, of course, entertaining uh, them as, uh, as a court magician. She would ask him to uh, perhaps conjure up magic and bring her a dish of ripe, uh, ripe grapes. And to which Faustus would reply with some regret, alas, madam, that's nothing. I mean, he, um, I mean, as if he is trying to tell himself, this is what I came uh, down to, to conjure up magic so that I can bring her a dish of ripe grapes. Um, again, he would, uh, he wouldn't really conjure up magic and have, uh, I mean, raising people from the dead like Alexander the Great or Helen of Troy. It was uh, only, you know, shadows of them. Uh, things that, uh, like I said, ordinary uh, magicians would do. There was nothing, uh, you know, about what he was doing. And then we'll move to Act 5, Scene 2, where we have the third and the last soliloquy. Um, and you can almost tell what uh, uh, we are in for. With the last soliloquy, you will have F Faustus. Um, you know, of course, he knows that his 24 years are, are almost over. And uh, um, he still has like an hour. Uh, before his uh, his soul uh, be given to the devil to uh, to throw into hellfire. So the play draws to a close with Faustus' final soliloquy, which is supposed to mark the last hour of his life. Um, of course, uh, what do you expect? He knows, of course, that the 24 years are almost uh, over, so it's only natural that he would, you know, kind of um, um, exhibit signs of, you know, regret and fear and all the, these kinds of things. Again, this is much too late. I mean, the idea of showing, again, repentance, the idea of showing regrets, is um, um, something that we're going to see, but there is obviously nothing that, uh, um, you know, Dr. Faustus can do in order to save himself. He is beyond uh, salvation this time around. So the soliloquy represents an attempt to imagine and dramatize what the last hour of life means or feels uh, like to a man awaiting certain damnation. And sometimes it happens. You know, I mean, you can 
you can have people who are perhaps terminally terminally sick and they know that uh, they have a few hours or a few days uh, um, to live and of course um, you know you can almost tell what kind of feelings they have let alone having somebody who has transgressed against God somebody who is uh, who knows that um, damnation is awaiting him um, again there are you know all kinds of uh, stage props that would tell you that it's only an hour that is left uh, you have uh, for example the clock ticking um, you have the first half hour is moving um, in a normal way, but the second half is a kind of, um, you know, gathering momentum and moving faster than um, usual. Um, and you will have, you know, Dr. Faust is talking himself, talking to himself in this soliloquy, and um, he would. Um, you know, kind of uh, show regrets by uh, wanting um, to perhaps trans transform into uh, a beast that would at one point uh, be extinct and um, becomes no more. And at another point, he, he would also uh, um, you know, um, uh, let, let, let's, um, I don't remember what, what else he wanted to be so that he can avoid the wrath of God. Ah, yes. He knows, he knows very well that he will be damned and uh, he will be thrown into hell. Um, and he is obviously uh, fine with that. If he cannot change that, that's okay. Uh, what he is not okay with would be the idea of eternal damnation. The fact that he would be there in hellfire forever and this is something that he uh, would like to perhaps change he would say uh, so faustus pleads with god to to place a limit on his time in hell and he says let faustus live in hell a thousand years a hundred thousand and at last be saved Uh, and of course, he knows that this this is not possible. He knows that hellfire is eternal for him. Again, remember the Faustus of Act One. Remember the Faustus of the first soliloquy, who was very uh, self-confident, who uh, believes that he can master, uh, he can go beyond his limits. Um, he wants uh, absolute power and absolute knowledge and absolute pleasure. Now, he is not asking for any of that. He is humbling down. He wants to be less a, than a human being. He wants to be a beast that would at one point dissolve into the elements when it dies. Okay, some brutish beast whose soul would simply dissolve into the elements when it dies. Or he, and this is also in sharp contrast with his big and grand dreams at the beginning, he would like to be changed into little water drops and fall into the ocean, never be found. See? So as you can see, Faust's self-assertive spirit collapses into a desire for extinction, for being no more. Desperate, um, <clears throat> his aspiration to divinity uh, 
into a longing for annihilation as he seeks desperately to escape from the heavy wrath of God. See? Again, towards the end, now that the soliloquy is over, we will have the chorus coming in in, on, in order to introduce what we call the epilogue. So we started off with the prologue, which is a kind of introduction, and we are ending with an epilogue, which is uh, a kind of conclusion. Again, the um, one character chorus would come in and would give us the moral of the play. He would tell us about uh, what uh, happened to Faustus, and um, he's, he's going to remind us uh, of, of everything one more time. And of course, there is going to be this idea of warning. Uh, he, uh, um, the, the chorus, uh, wants to warn us uh, that um, Faustus' terrible fate is what awaits all those forward wits who uh, practice more than heavenly power permits. This seems to be the message of the entire play. We're talking about forward wits, people who are supremely intelligent, people who are, who are you know, exceptional, um, uh, but um, they, they, they don't humble down. They are not modest enough. Um, and obviously, uh, if they don't humble down, they, they would practice more than heavenly uh, power permits. And in this case, they would meet the fate of people like Dr. Faustus. <clears throat> okay, so we come to the idea of whether the play is a morality play or a tragedy. Um, we spoke enough, we spoke long and enough about the morality play, spoke about the moral messages that a morality play uh, gives to uh, members of the audience. What we did uh, speak about was the idea of tragedy. So we started off the play uh, by referring to it as, uh, as a morality play, spoke about the elements of the morality play as given uh, in Dr. Faustus um, and the good and the evil angel, the, um, um, the old man, right? Um, and now we're ending the play with the idea of tragedy. So tragedy is um, a genre, is um, one of the genres of drama. If we talk about drama, we talk about tragedy, we talk about comedy, we talk about uh, romantic comedy, we talk about comedy of manners. You have different genres when it comes to drama. And tragedy happens to be one big uh, genre. And of course, it has its uh, rules and regulations. Um, so tragedy is not an Elizabethan invention. It has always, or up till that point, it had always been there. Um, and it started with the Greeks. The Greeks started um, tragedy. And um, if you're familiar with uh, Greek literature, you would have people like Sophocles, you would have a tragedy, tragedy like Oedipus, the king, uh, you would have people uh, like Euripides and, um, and Aeschylus. All these people are um, great tragedy writers. Um, and they, they made or they created a framework that, or a template, a tragedy, a tragic template that everybody is, is uh, you know, following with slight differences from one age to another. So, how could we know about tragedies? How could we know about the framework of a tragedy and what it includes and what it doesn't? We got to know about the Aristotle, the great philosopher, Greek philosopher, who wrote uh, a book and he, uh, he named the book um, Poetics. And in the Poetics, 
uh, Aristotle would give us the definition of tragedy and its different elements. So what does Aristotle say about tragedy? Um, at the core of a tragedy, you have um, a hero or a main character who moves uh, from, you know, from a state of uh, perhaps um, um, what uh, he lives um, um, a life that is full of um, bounty. Uh, he lives a life of uh, pleasures, and I mean his life is fine and everything, and he moves from this stage of bountiness and this uh, stage of, you know, um, of being well off, uh, I mean, morally, uh, uh, materially and everything to a state of adversity. Adversity means disaster um, and uh, bad fortune. So you're moving with a tragedy. You have somebody who moves from good fortune to bad fortune. Okay, this individual that we're talking about is um, not totally good, but he is not evil. He, I mean, he's, he's a human being with exceptional skills and exceptional gifts, of course. But like human beings, he has some kind of flu or frailty or weakness within his character, and this flow or weakness normally brings about his downfall at the end. Okay, so what is the function of tragedy according to Aristotle? The function of tragedy according to Aristotle would be to, um, you know, to stir and arouse our pity and fear. As members of the audience, at the end of the play, we have those emotions of pity and fear aroused in us. So pity for what and fear for what? Why? So of course we, we take pity on, on this fallen hero or fallen individual because he wasn't bad. Uh, um, um, he was not entirely bad. He was noble. He comes perhaps from a noble family. He is exceptional in his skills and in his abilities, but he has this flu. He is vulnerable like any human being. So like any human being, uh, he is susceptible to errors. He makes errors like any human being. So you, you take pity on him because you are exactly like him. You are, you are also a human being and you can make errors and mistakes. And who, who wouldn't? Who, doesn't make errors and mistakes. So you take pity on him because you put yourself in his position. You say, uh, perhaps at one point I can be him and I can make or commit the errors that he makes, being a human being. So this is the, the pity part of the story. And then you have fear. So fear is also, you're fearful that at one point you would be tested like him you would make the same errors. And eventually, you would have the same fate. You would die tragically at the end. So this is uh, the concept of tragedy um, as given by Aristotle, as given by the Greeks. Now, if you apply the concept and its different elements to Dr. Faustus, you can uh, say that it is also a tragedy. Okay, so where is this character? Remember that at the core of a tragedy, you have somebody who moves from good fortune to bad fortune. Do, do we have that? Do we have this character? Hello. Yes, yes, we have. Ah, yes. yes, of course, it's Dr. Faustus, right? We also have um, a character who is exceptional in everything. 
he has great talents and he has great skills, but he has a flow or a frailty or a weakness within his character. Do we have that? Yes, we have. Yes, uh, yeah, it's the same thing. It's Dr. Faustus, who is exceptional. Remember at the beginning when we get to know that he has mastered all the sciences and the arts on Earth. Remember law, medicine. Right. And he uh, he is uh, he wasn't bad when when we have seen him at the beginning and even prior, he wasn't bad. He was just a human being with exceptional talents and gifts who wanted more. So perhaps wanting more is his weakness. Wanting more would, uh, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, would be his, um, I mean, the point that would bring about his downfall at the end. So wanting more, his weakness, the fact that he was um, he, he was having this intellectual pride would uh, make it uh, or, or, or would uh, prompt him to have this deal with the devil, right? And this is an error of judgment. Would he get away with it? No, of course. He would have to die at the end tragically. Typical of tragic heroes. Typical of the heroes of tragedies. He have to die, he has to die a tragic death. And what would be more tragic than having your soul uh, thrown into hell? Right? So you can safely say that, yeah, Dr. Faustus can be seen or can be considered a tragedy with Dr. Faustus, the tragic hero who would, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, have this weakness within his character, his vaulting ambition, his um, intellectual pride, and this would uh, make him uh, make a number of errors. One big one would be the, 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 the pact or the agreement that he would have with the devil, and he would uh, um, at the end die tragically by having his soul thrown into hell and that would be uh, would stir and arouse our feelings of pity and fear so pity because we take pity on him because he is a human being he is vulnerable vulnerable just like every one of us and fear that at one point we may be uh, uh, um, having the same uh, circumstances, we will maybe put in the same situation um, and we would fail in this big test and our souls would be thrown into hell. See? So it does, the play does conform to the description of a tragic play. Again, the wheel comes full circle. We're talking about the hero, Dr. Faustus, and the author, uh, Christopher Marlowe, and how similar they are. Uh, and the question would pop up, does Dr. Faustus tell us about its notorious author? Does the play, now that we have read, now that we have discussed this, discussed it, does the play, do you feel that it supports or invalidates the dominant view of Marlowe as the bad boy of Elizabethan drama? Now that you have read the play, now that you have listened to the discussion and the, the I mean, the interpretations in the chapter, do you think Marlowe is the bad boy of the Elizabethan drama. Does the play confirm and support this idea or does it invalidate it? Invalidate it means that no, 
So um, does it support? Uh, I'm asking you. We said that Dr. Faust, uh, that Marlu was an overreacher. He was um, a rule breaker. He was a challenge, a challenger of existing orthodoxies. Do you think that by reading Dr. Faustus, uh, do you think that reading Dr. Faust supports that? I'm asking you. Yes, it does. Yes, it yes, does. Doctor, I think. It. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah I, I need to. Uh, yeah, if you if, if you're saying yes, yeah, please come to the mic and uh, perhaps elaborate on this idea. If you say no, no, also come to the mic and give us um, a bit what uh, of what you think. Yeah, the mic is yours. So those who believe, those who believe that Dr. Faustus the play supports the idea that uh, Marlu was um, was radical, was a challenger of orthodoxies, was an uh, um, a, a rule breaker. Those who believe that the play supports that, please um, tell us why. Um, yeah, what's can your I name? answer, Daniel? Oh. Daniel, yeah, go ahead, yeah, Daniel. Um, I do agree that Marlowe's play of Dr. Faustus, like, actually come to the agreement of what he believes in real life, but he also, like, gives, like, although, like, people said he's an atheist, there's a moral lesson that when you go bad, you end in a bad way. So yes, he, he it was challenging, it was a rule breaker because no one else, I think, in his era of time um, argued the fact with angels, devils, um, going against the God's will and religion and like summoning um, uh, Mr. Follis and everything, like all these kind, it's like really rule breakers for his time of being at the time. Like, I don't so, know if you get my, my idea, like, of what I'm saying. You're trying to say, uh, Dania, if I understood you well, you're trying to say that uh, Dr. Faustus, um, you know, kind of supports the dominant idea about um, Christopher Marlowe, that he was a challenger of orthodoxies, that he was, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, a transgressor, somebody who would, wouldn't settle for easy answers. Yeah, always reaching for more, always reaching mm. for what's behind that reason, like why, why, like why the earth is round, for example, why something like that, like, mm. but f at the same time, although they said that he was an atheist, I'm talking about Marlowe, yes. Yes. Mm. atheist, yes. um, mm. they, like, he still gave a more of a uh, mm. lesson about religion. So like, is he really uh, an atheist? He is he's wavering like Dr. Faustus himself. You don't know whether he is, uh, um, you know, whether he is on this side or that one, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. Like yes, and this is the confusion that we uh, we normally get. I mean, you don't, you're not one hundred uh, percent sure of whether uh, Marlu was uh, um, for the idea of transgression and the idea of. Uh, you know, rule breaking and all these kinds of things, or was he uh, trying to warn people against uh, transgression? Exactly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. This is the challenge that we are still having until this moment. Okay, Dania. Thank you so much. Can we have somebody else? Hello. Hello. Uh, okay, so um, I, I'm done. Uh, if you have, uh, um, I'll give you perhaps you know, five minutes for questions before we call it a night. So if you have any questions, please come to the mic and share them with us.
Um, doctor, if a question came, Dania, Dania. Okay, Dania. Uh, if a question came uh, in the quiz or whatever, if it's a tragedy or a morality play, mm. so what's like the certain answer for them, sure, Yan? I mean, I mean, you're. Um, oh, it's, uh, it depends on how you see it, yeah, Dania. If you think it's a tragedy, you would. Say, uh, I mean, you give uh, perhaps a definition of what a tragedy is, and then you try to uh, bring examples that would show that it is a tragedy. But I if, see it as both. Ah, you can you can talk about it, and uh, you know, there is obviously nothing wrong with mentioning the fact that it can be both. No problem. Yeah, but I mean, like, if it comes in tomorrow's exam, there is like multiple choice. Like mm. what's for sure to be correct? Well, if you say it's a tragedy, you have your own reasons. And if you have a, uh, if you say that it's a morality play, you also have your own reasons. We wouldn't put you in, in, in a situation like this. I re let me reassure you. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else before we call it a night? Thank you, Doctor. You're welcome. Taib, on this note and with this item, we'll come to the end of to, 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 to tonight's class and I'll see you inshallah on Wednesday. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Good boy. Bye bye. bye. Uh, uh,